this working better than the other one? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I know I'm toward the back there, they weren't able, they can't hear back there. Can't hear you. All right, I guess I got to really uh, hold up there. Um, <clears throat> well, it's good to see the good turnout that we have. <clears throat> Our first one since uh, the COVID hit us. And um, tell you, um, back through 2020, um, everything shut down. I think that was the spring of 2020. And, um, you know, it's difficult. Everybody was sheltered in. And, um, it was kind of funny because I could go to the liquor store and buy beer and wine, but uh, several months has gone by and I, I couldn't get a haircut because they didn't have, they didn't allow uh, barber shops to be open, at least uh, most places. So anyway, things got pretty desperate. Let me get this open. Up. Something here. I had a cute photo to show you to get you laughing and everything, but it's, it's not gonna, it won't open up. Okay. Um, I guess I should have tested this better when I set anything up. Well, anyway, I can describe it to you. I got real long hair, and my wife has a hair clipper, and she's trying to cut my hair. <laughs> and we, uh, we set this up on my deck, and then we sent it out to a bunch of <clears throat> family and friends. But I don't know, I can't get it to come up, but maybe later on I'll, I'll get that. So let's go to the Bluebird program then. Um, one of the things that I... Going back to the last convention when we uh, we had it, um, had a few comments afterwards that uh, we had a, a bluebird convention and nobody talked about bluebirds. So uh, I decided, well, I could book myself pretty easily for that. And I have a program that I, I give um, in the southern part of the state anyway, Dane County in, in that area. Um, and I could probably do this in my sleep, but I always like to start out with uh, this, um, this picture of this bluebird on the, on the title frame. Uh, back in the, well, 2003 or four, when uh, you know people were just starting to get into digital photography, and but cameras weren't really readily available too much on the market yet. Um, I worked for a publishing company, and we had been using digital uh, cameras for about 10 years already. So I had a little uh, two megapixel pocket camera that I bought to, to take a trip to Belize. And uh, one day I was driving back on, uh, home from work on my motorcycle and I stopped at Lake Farms County Park in Madison where I had a bluebird box set up, a uh, Peterson box. And I had a pair of bluebirds that wanted to nest in that box and the tree swallows, there were like five or six pair of tree swallows that were just trying to get that box and steal it from them. And I noticed this male bluebird was just fighting them off like crazy because the, the hen had a nest in there but hadn't laid eggs yet. And all I had was this little camera and a little pair of binoculars. And uh, he was sitting in a tree, I couldn't get real close to him. So I held the binoculars up to the trunk of the tree and I zoomed into the eyepiece. And that's one of my first digital photos that I took of a bluebird using both the telephoto of the camera and the, uh, the binoculars. So I always like to point that out. And then, you know, since then I've got better cameras and can stand a mile away practically and get a photo like that. So um, one of the things that uh, I do with the data that I collect uh, about bluebirds is I do report at the Madison Audubon Society. I've been active with them, active with them since uh, the late 1970s. And um, then of course the Bluebird Restoration Association of Wisconsin uh, gets all the data too. I'd like to start out with this quote from Aldo Leopold because I think it's really appropriate uh, to what we're doing uh, he mentions this uh, uh, back in the late 1930s already, um, that 
you know, we venture their uh, skill to build their habitat. And what we found out with bluebirds, of course, is that um, their natural habitat was disappearing uh, because of house sparrows and starlings and trees being cut down. But uh, by building these nest boxes and putting them out and, and maintaining them, we've really helped turn this around and bring the bluebirds back. So I'd like to start out by, um, I know I'm preaching to the choir here a little bit, but uh, like I said, this is just you know factual information uh, for everybody. Of course, the male and, and uh, female bluebird, and um, the the male on top, of course, has more color. Well, this doesn't work on these TVs, does it? Not too well anyway. Hey, you can kind of see it. And the female's got a little bit more of the grayer back. And then fledglings, of course, look very similar to baby robins, except the long coloring, and they have more streaking rather than black speckles and things, but. Um, always nice when you go to check a box and you find these fledglings sitting in the trees uh, begging and waiting to be fed. So one of the things, uh, of course, that's key is habitat. And uh, this was taken several years ago at Kiganza State Park. Um, it's an overflow parking lot for the, the beach crowd. And um, so I put a box up. Shining up on the ceiling. Yeah, it hits the glass and goes up. Um, put a box up right up here. And uh, the first year I put it there, um, I had uh, three nests of bluebirds and fledged about 15 bluebirds from that one box that, that first year. And uh, when I took over this trail, they had most of the boxes all on one hillside. Um, Cub Scouts had donated them, people had built them, and the rangers just kept putting them in one place in the park. And um, when I took over the trail from the previous monitor, um, she was quite elderly and wasn't able to move boxes, but I kind of spaced things around. And when I put this one and got those three uh, uh, broods out of there, I thought, man, I am really good at this, you know. But then the following year, I had two pair of bloopers that fought over that box, and they kept burying each other's eggs and dumping eggs out. And I just saw one ruined nest after another. And I thought, I've got other boxes in the park. Why, why do they have to fight over this one? And so the second year, it wasn't until mid-July that I finally got a bluebird pair that actually laid three eggs and raised three young. So I went from 15 down to three real quickly. And if that doesn't deflate your ego, I, I tell you. Um, it, has, it has been pretty good overall, but um, Eventually, the tree swell was discovered, of course, and I uh, haven't really had any, you know, too much trouble with wrens there. Um, one of the things you've got to be careful about, of course, is uh, having it out in the open and away from all those trees and shrubs. And then the picnic table is for people. The bluebirds don't use those. <laughs> so this is a box that I found several years ago south of Madison. And, um, you know, I, I think the, the people that put it up uh, had good intentions and and uh, probably mounted it when the field was open more. Uh, there wasn't that big bush growing there. But, um, you know, it's a hill lake box, which is a real deep one that they had for raccoons not being able to reach down in there. But um, it's awfully low to the ground. And I know some people put boxes low because house sparrows won't nest low, but bluebirds will. But low boxes can also be um, easy for critters to get in there too. But anyway, uh, this habitat's pretty overgrown. You can figure there's probably a wren or mice or something living in a box like this. So proper maintenance is always important. Monitoring, of course, that's one of the things that we promote. This is Dale Moody checking a bluebird box on one of his trails. It took this several years ago. And then, uh, of course, we have the easy form <clears throat> that you can fill out and uh, you know, I don't know if you remember the old form that used to be like doing your taxes, but uh, you know, we we decided to make this a little bit simpler. And then, of course, um, it's gotten better every year to to file online and to just go online and do it. And um, I think nowadays, most of the time, that works pretty good. So, uh, another motorcycle story I can tell you. Um, I was. Uh, this was at the uh, Kiganda State Park. I was checking my boxes one Sunday, and um, one of the things I, I kind of noticed when I was doing trails is that when, when bluebirds are just about ready to finish with that first brood, 
and I was checking the boxes and the chicks may have been about 12 days old or so. I always noticed that nearby in a tree, there would always be a pair of tree swallows. And they're always just kind of watching. And I kind of thought, you know those tree swallows, they want that nest as soon as those chicks fledge the box. Well, in this particular case, the tree swallows were there. But when I went and checked the box, this is what I found. Uh, there's one tree swallow egg to the left. There's one dead bluebird in the middle. There were, there were five bluebirds in this box. And then there's one chick that still is in the box. And I've never really had tree swallows kill a bluebird before. Um, and I assume that the other three, uh, since they're so close to fledging, they may have escaped and got out of there because I don't think the tree swallows would be able to carry out a, a, a dead bluebird chick in there. But so anyway, I had one live chick left in this box and I thought, well, um, the tree swallows are pretty aggressive. I couldn't see the parent bluebirds around anywhere. So I decided to take the chick and put it in my camera bag on my, ca on my motorcycle and put a little material in there. And I had a box that I just checked about a half mile into the park. And I thought it had uh, four chicks in it, about the same age. So you know what you do is you just take an orphan and put it in there because fortunately bluebird parents can't count, right? <laughs> so when I was checking to make sure they were still there, the chick climbs out of the box and sits on top of my oh. tank bag. Oh. Oh. So that's my biker chick story for you. <laughs> I, I, I did go back there, and uh, a couple of days later, to that nest box, and all five chicks had fledged, and I didn't find any dead ones on the ground, so uh, it worked. So let's go to the Bluebird Basics. It uh, doesn't hurt to review a little bit of this, but the female selects the box. Um, she builds a nest, and the male defends the territory, and both guard the nest and box. So, you know, I noticed every once in a while there's a male bluebird sitting on the box with some grass in his beak or something, nest material, but he never builds a nest. But he just does that to impress the ladies and she ain't gonna let him in the box to do any decorating. <laughs> so, you know, you do wanna place it in an open spot. Uh, you feel morning sun is better just to warm the box up on those uh, cold spring days. Um, you know, I, we mount the box on a metal post and uh, Five to six feet above ground. Of course, we all know that bluebirds will use um, poles that are 20 feet high, but then you have to haul a big ladder around with you whenever you check your trail. So it's always easier to do it at that five to six foot level so you can peek in the box real easily. And then we face the entrance uh, southeast away from prevailing winds. Um, I know uh, Cornell, I believe, says to do it north, east, and east, but uh, I found in Wisconsin that in spring we get some really cold uh, breezes off of uh, Lake Michigan yet, even, even inland and by um, south of Madison. So I kind of prefer that southeast and, uh, and away from the northwest winds works better. South would probably be good too. Um, but, you know, the, I've had bluebirds that nest in boxes that face west that they um, have protection from the west too. But anyway, that's what I recommend. And then additional, uh, the spacing of additional boxes. Uh, of course, this was a controversy years ago, but we do the 100 yards apart. And I know that in some parts of the state where there's um, heavy tree swallows that people do pair boxes. Um, I know around Cork on Marshall a lot of times people will, will pair boxes just because tree swallows are so abundant there. Um, so I, I understand that people like to do that. And if it works, you know, that's fine. Um, Minnesota, really pushes doing the, the paired box thing um, much more than any other um, state that I know of, but uh, they said it works there, so that's what they like to do. Um, and then, you know, it always helps to have a tree nearby, and the, the boomers, when they fudge the box, instead of going right to the ground, um, they can fly up to uh, a perch and be off the ground and uh, find some place safe to wait for the parents to find them and feed them. And then the, uh, of course, the entrance hole, um, when they uh, discovered that starlings were a nuisance in boxes with a larger entrance hole, that one and a half inch kind of eliminated the starlings as one of the um, birds that, uh, invasive non-native birds that would take the boxes. 
Um, of course, then the, uh, Peterson from Minnesota came up with the oval hole, but it's still narrow enough that um, a, uh, a starling can't get into it. And generally, a one and a half inch hole does prevent a cowbird hen from getting in the box too. Um, although I think sometimes they're persistent, they do manage to get in sometimes. I haven't had a cowbird egg in a nest in 10 years, so. Um, when you start monitoring and you, you're checking your trail and you've had success, yes. you look and you find that hen sitting in the box. And this is, you know, sometimes they uh, you open the box and they just kind of go like, hi, what do you want? And uh, this one, I just happened to have my camera with me and took her picture and closed the box up. I can always count eggs or chicks later. This would be eggs, of course. Um, but I can always check and, and count those later. So I just marked this as an occupied bluebird box. And then when you do start uh, finding the nest um, open, typically you're going to get the, the small baby blue eggs like the nest there. And, um, very robin blue color too, but a little bit smaller. You can see the nest is a nice clean nest. They don't need mud to hold it together because the box itself keeps the nest in place. And uh, this one happened to use a little bit of um, pine needles. Most of the time they use grasses. And then about 5% of uh, hens don't have the ability to color the egg blue. They're just genetically not uh, made to do that. So they have white eggs. And uh, for about three years at Kiganza State Park, probably about 15 years ago now, I did have a, a white egg uh, layer. And I could, it was kind of nice because when she laid her first brood and got it out, then when she laid her next brood, I knew where she jumped to because she's the only one laying white eggs. And then the following year, I had two hens that were laying white eggs because every hen that has a female chick, that female gets the same genetic uh, ability or not to uh, have colored eggs and will lay white eggs. And then after about three or four seasons, they both disappeared. And I, you know, I guess bluebirds in the wild probably live about four or five years. So, um, and then I also noticed that around the state park, when people started to walk around and see the success of bluebirds there, that um, they started putting out nest boxes in their yards and stuff. So they probably started attracting some of the bluebirds away. So then after a couple of weeks of incubation, you always open the box and you, you see that nice bright yellow coat where uh, the little chick thinks that you're going to feed it something. They grow so fast, it's amazing. Um, and then this happens to be a box that uh, has three, they're pretty close to maybe a day or so away from fledging, getting up there. You know, we kind of tell people if they're not, uh, depending upon the box design you have, but after about 12 days, you know, it's a little risky to open a box because they could prematurely jump out and then you can't put them back in. Um, so you have to be a little bit careful with the, open the box if you know they're gonna be close to fledging that you don't uh, startle them and have them jump out. So here's our, our chart as of 2021. And uh, you can see that um, the dark blue line up above is our bluebird production. And uh, for whatever reason, 2012 was uh, the banner year. Um, a lot of us reported triple nest. Uh, that was the year that I went in the end of March just to make sure my boxes were empty, no mice had moved in, and no house sparrows had, had started to put in their sticks that they do. And I found uh, three nest boxes at Kiganda State Park that had nests with eggs already. And I thought, wow, I, I can't believe that they're nesting in the end of March. I never had that. Usually it's mid to late April when I would find nests with eggs. But for some reason, and that was kind of a statewide thing, everybody started reporting bluebirds nesting early. And um, so, yeah, we had a, we had a banner year. Um, you know, over 35,000. It was 36,000 something that was reported that year. Um, but it's very cyclical. Uh, you can kind of see um, different things. Uh, if Joe Halloran was still alive, he'd point out that here's where we eliminated pairing boxes and tell, told people to put them 100 yards apart single space. And he thought that was very helpful. This also happens to be about the time that I joined Bra. 
<laughs> so, anyway, then you can kind of tell that we've had some harsh spring weather. Um, I just remember a couple of late Mays uh, going out and finding um, either dead chicks or abandoned nests. The eggs were abandoned because it was like 45 degrees out a week before Memorial Day. It was heavy rain for two or three days and those poor bluebirds had to survive themselves. They didn't have time to feed chicks or, or sit on nests because uh, you know it's survival. But um, the thing about that is you clean out the nest and put it all back together, put the house back together and you know a couple weeks later you go and check and then the bluebird's got a new nest going. So um, you know you have those downfalls and a lot of times they still produce uh, two broods anyway even though they had a freeze out. Um, what we, we kind of found is uh, when you get to about 2015 down to 2019 or 18 there, uh, again, it was really kind of several uh, spring bad weather things. Um, and then the, the real bad drop happened two years ago <laughs> when uh, <coughs> Texas had all those uh, snowstorms and cold weather throughout the state. I don't you probably remember that being in the news where their power grid collapsed and um, you know people were were fleeing Texas to go to warmer places which is kind of odd because a lot of Wisconsin people flee to go down there to be warm. But uh, the other thing that happened was uh, besides that cold weather uh, hitting those bluebirds, about the time that our bluebirds in the southern Gulf states would start heading back to Wisconsin, there was like one week of tornado weather that went across Arkansas and the southern states there and it would be right about the time that we want our bluebirds to be you know making migration this way so uh, that's something we can't control and we just have to cross our fingers and and hope that you know by having double nest and producing anywhere from 8 to 12 chicks each uh, year that each one of these pairs that does make it um, does produce enough to help us get that, that line going back up in the other direction. Um, I want to point out that we do monitor the tree swallows just because we don't want tree swallow numbers plummeting and bluebird numbers going up because we don't want people removing tree swallow nests and we want to make sure that the other native birds are doing well. So we kind of use that. Um, if we were the tree swallow society and everybody was counting tree swallows, we probably would have reverse numbers. We would all be saying, yeah, the tree swallow numbers are high and we wouldn't be watching bluebirds as much, but since we're in the bluebirds, that's what we're tracking. And then the number of boxes that we put out varies quite a bit. Uh, we keep trying to increase that, get it going back up. Um, would increase membership and people getting boxes out there and uh, a couple of the different things we got going with um, nest box programs. And then, uh, you know, we all kind of experienced this kind of thing. Um, and we, we unfortunately, um, the ones that we do produce, that, uh, you know, half of them uh, make it and half of them don't, basically. And of course, any bird that migrates is going to have uh, uh, numbers lost because of the fact that uh, the dangers of migration, whether it's weather or windows or, you know, cars or cats or raccoons or whatever, um, there is going to be some losses. 